everyone. I'm Stan Mallow. Welcome to Paranormal Yacker. My guest on today's show is award-winning investigative journalist and writer Ross Coulthard. Uh, Ross was an investigative reporter on 60 Minutes Australia and has won numerous journalism awards, including Australia's top award for journalism. I'll be yakking with Ross about his breakthrough book that's causing a star around the world and in all probability in galaxies beyond our world. That book is in plain sight, an investigation into UFOs and impossible science. Ross Coldhart, welcome to Paranormal Yacker. G'day, Stan from Down Under, and hello to your listeners and viewers. Do you recall, Ross, when you first became interested in the UFO phenomena, and what was it that sparked that interest? Was it something you saw or read or perhaps personally experienced? Look, I think like a lot of kids growing up in 1960s New Zealand, where I was raised, we were saturated, our generation, with UFO stories. And uh, I remember there was a, a great TV series called UFO that was a British TV series that was incredibly sexy. Lots of uh, scantily clad women dressed in the sexy sort of 1970s clothes. And I remember um, it was a secret battle against aliens and things like that. So there was a lot going on in fiction. But the, the big moment for me, I think, was was in 1978 when I was 16 years old and there was in the northeast coast of the South Island of New Zealand a sighting over a place called Kaikoura which became very famous it went round the world and a Australian TV reporter called Quentin Fogarty and his cameraman Davy Crockett shot from a Argosy cargo aircraft images of apparently solid orb objects coming up to the the cockpit of the cargo plane and literally buzzing the aircraft. And this was witnessed as well by the captain who was aptly named Bill Startup. And all of the people on the plane that night confirmed that they'd seen solid objects coming up to the craft and then zooming away. And they were very concerned that whatever they were, they did not appear to be known terrestrial technology. They weren't of this world. And so the world was very excited. It went around the world at Christmas time, 1978. And the film was quite high quality. It was amazing. You could see a kind of a lenticular disc-shaped object behind the glow. And about three weeks after Christmas, the Prime Minister of New Zealand at the time, who we all knew as Piggy Muldoon, Robert Piggy Muldoon, he came out and he reassuringly announced to the public at the time, ladies and gentlemen, we've decided that what this was was reflections of squid boat lights. So boats on the water, 14,000 feet below, and it was a weird refraction that occurred that reflected these lights on clouds, not to worry. There's nothing here. Go away, get on with your lives and move on. And I suppose like a lot of people, as a more trusting 16-year-old boy, I accepted that explanation. And it took me quite a few years to catch up with that case and return to it before I, when I became a journalist. But I joined the ranks of the New Zealand Herald newspaper a few years later, and I got to interview Piggy Muldoon, the former prime minister, and I asked him, about that UFO incident. And he actually privately admitted to me that he had some reservations about the explanation that had been offered by the New Zealand Air Force. So I guess it was in the back of my mind years and years ago, it was planted in my head as a young 20 something to be somewhat skeptical about official explanations for UAPs, for unidentified aerial phenomena. Because even the prime minister of the country that I was living in at the time was a little embarrassed about the official explanation. And then years later, I met a guy called John Cordy, who, as it turned out, was the air traffic control radar operator at Wellington Airport, 30 miles across Cook Strait, which is the body of water that separates New Zealand's North and South Island. And he admitted to me that he was in the control tower that night and he saw these objects on radar and tracked them moving in concurrence with what was being described by the two reporters on board the aircraft. And essentially he said, Ross, whatever they were, they weren't squid boat lights. And uh, sure as hell, you don't get squid boats flying at 14,000 feet and zooming around an aircraft that's moving along the coast at several hundred kilometers an hour. 
I realized that we'd been snowed. And then when I spoke to people in New Zealand and looked at the declassified Royal New Zealand Air Force reports that, that have since become public from the New Zealand archives over 30 years later, I realized the public was snowed. We were essentially deceived and misled. And subsequently, sources have suggested to me that there was in fact an intervention by the American intelligence services to encourage the New Zealand government to basically make an explanation quickly for this sighting, put it under the carpet and so everybody would immediately dismiss it, which is what I'd done as a 16-year-old boy. So I came to Australia, I guess, forewarned and kind of primed, if you like, to be sceptical about official explanations for this phenomenon. And then whilst I was working for the show called Four Corners here in Australia, which is a bit like your PBS Frontline, it's a very well-resourced, illustrious public broadcaster, public affairs show. And I was doing a story on the New Zealand Air Force, on the Australian Air Force. And in the course of that story, I was with very senior officers from the Australian Air Force. And at the end of a long day of filming, they invited us to have a drink in the officers' mess of the um, Air Force base that we were at. And at one stage, one of them leaned across to me and said, why don't you chaps do stories about flying saucers, UFO? And I was a reporter. I was an investigative reporter for one of the top public affairs shows in Australia. And I, I scoffed and I said, you don't do stories on UFOs. They're rubbish. They're bullshit. And he went, no, they're not. I mean, this man was, I, I wish I could name him, but you know, he's still alive and he was a very, very eminent, well-respected senior member of our Air Force. Over the course of that evening, we had a few more beers and he invited pilots that were in the mess to come over and talk to me. And essentially, he was really keen for me as a reporter to do a story about UAP. And there was a reconnaissance pilot for a P-3 Orion surveillance aircraft that flew way out into the Indian Ocean to monitor the Indian Navy and also the Soviets. And what was fascinating was he had been flown beside by a lenticular metallic disc-shaped object. And I leaned across in the course of the evening thinking I had a great journalistic scoop. And um, I said, oh, would you ever go on camera? Would you ever talk about it? And he said, not bloody likely, mate. He said, you don't talk about UFO sighting. He says, I'm happy to confess to you here. I've seen them. But he says, there's no way I'd ever talk about it publicly. And that was a consistent theme right through my journalistic career that there were a lot of people who'd had sightings of these weird objects. And I, you notice I'm not saying it's aliens. I'm not saying it's little green men from Zug. All I'm saying is that there is a mystery, a genuine mystery. And I've been aware of it for 35, 40 years as an investigative journalist. And in the course of my career, I was really struck by how in the mainstream media, there was a default position from editors and executive producers of TV shows that you do not cover this stuff seriously. You only ever cover UFOs with ridicule and derision. And frankly, sometimes that's legitimate because sometimes there are some people who are plain bonkers crazy who are making claims about UFOs. But what really struck me was in the course of my career, especially when I've been involved in a managerial position on a news program, I've been quite struck by the fact that people would ring and offer information that was often highly credible. Often they were military people, often they were government public servants offering information. And they were saying, look, you know, you guys need to look into these strange objects that have been seen here. Um, here's a radar track, you know, here's video, look at it. Investigated. And time and time again throughout my career, I was really struck by the fact that it was shut down. And it really wasn't until the New York Times in 2017 decided to publish a series of stories that revealed that the US Navy had had encounters through its carrier battle group, the USS Nimitz, in the middle of 2004. It wasn't until 2017, December 2017, when the New York Times, one of the world's greatest newspapers, had the courage to actually run a series of stories that revealed that the US Navy had seen these objects, they'd tracked them on radar, top of the line phased array radar systems, and they'd videoed them and they'd shown them on forward looking infrared and they couldn't explain them. It really wasn't until that story that I felt liberated enough as a freelance investigative journalist away from the constraints of network television to pitch a story, ironically back to network television and say, look, you know, I think there's a documentary in this. And it was very funny because the documentary that we made has now been seen over 15 million times. It's had one of the biggest audiences that we've ever had for a film. And it's because I think there's a wisdom of the crowd about UAPs, UFOs, whatever they are, people 
are interested in them. And they, they agree that the mainstream media has largely dropped the ball in covering this subject. And I guess that's an issue I'm trying to remedy now, because I'm fascinated that as a result of the book that I wrote in plain sight, and as a result of the documentary I made for a cha- an Australian TV network, Channel 7, which I called the UFO phenomenon, which people can watch on Seven Spotlight UFO if they just put that into YouTube, we've been swamped, absolutely swamped with really interesting tips and information from all over the world from people who are gratified that a mainstream media investigative reporter is finally looking at this issue. And I can tell you, there's some really interesting information coming in the door. You, Ross, have a solid reputation for your honesty in telling things as they are. You've done that within plain sight. Regretfully, as you just mentioned, that's not the case with everyone in the media, especially when it comes to UFOs. Why this disdain by some segments in the media when it comes to their coverage of UFOs. Okay, I always thought, initially, I always thought it was just journalists by nature, default sceptics, and we take the piss, we laugh at things that we think might be. But I realised when I looked in the historical archives of your uh, American CIA and the Defence Intelligence Agency and different other three-letter agencies in the US, if you look at the history, and I'm a historian as well as a journalist, if you look at the history of what's detailed in America's public archives, the National Archives, declassified government file. If you go right back to the Robertson panel, which happened in the early 1950s, a deliberate decision is expressed in these documents by the US Air Force to use ridicule, stigma, and taboo to try and stop people talking about the UFO subject. The reason, the motivation for why they chose to do that is never adequately explained. There's a very clear policy directive at the early 1950s to shut this down. Now, the conspiracy theorists say... This is because the US recovered alien technology. I don't know that for sure. I have a suspicion it's true, actually, which is incredible when you think about it. But the conspiracists believe that in 1947 onward, multiple craft were recovered by the US government in secret, and that there's now, for much of the last 70 plus years, been a a back engineering program attempting to back engineer this technology. I don't know that. When I say no, I can't reach a conclusion definitively that that's true. But what I can say is that there's been a cover up. There has definitely been a cover-up. And that cover-up is actually articulated in an official government document where the United States government decided to shut down the UFO issue. They made a strategic decision to use ridicule, contempt, dismissiveness, and prosaic, r- ridiculous, absurd prosaic explanations like swamp gas and weather balloons to explain away often complex anomalous phenomena that privately the records show they couldn't explain. And you might remember there was a a project, an investigation by the the US Air Force called Project Blue Book. It concluded in 1969-1970 and the public was told that Project Blue Book essentially reached the conclusion that in the vast majority of these anomalous object cases they could be prosaically explained with a mundane explanation. You know, it might be, it was swamp gas it might be it was a lenticular shaped cloud. Whatever it was, it wasn't little green men from Zog. And so the um, the public was reassured that Project Blue Book had done an exhaustive 10 year investigation and we could all go back to our jobs and feel reassured that our military had done the right thing. These are no threat to national security, no issue for flight safety, get on with your lives, move on, treat UFOs with the ridicule and contempt they deserve and just get on with your life. What's really interesting is that we now know that was another a lie by the US Air Force. For whatever reason, the US Air Force has lied and lied and lied about UFO UAP sighting. It has misled the public right back to the incident at Roswell in 1947, where the conspiracists believed that an alien spacecraft was recovered. I'm not so sure. I'm, ag- I'm agnostic on Roswell. But what I do believe is that the US Air Force, on its own admission, has lied and concealed and tried to cover up whatever it was that happened. And I do not not find the current explanation, which is the fourth explanation offered by the US Air Force, that this was some kind of spy balloon that does not suffice to explain what happened at Roswell. There's too much evidence to indicate that it was something more than that. And so we're in a really interesting period in 
history right now, because for the first time, really, in 70 plus years, the Congress, no less, the, the, the US Parliament has mandated that the congressional committees like the Armed Services Committee, the Senate Intelligence Committee, must be given reports on what the government knows about UFOs. For the first time ever, congressional oversight committees are mandated by legislation that they will receive information on anomalous objects that are seen in our sky, including whether there's been any material recovered, craft recovered, including whether there's been any anomalous biological effects on people that have come up close with these objects. This is unprecedented. And so we're moving at right now, this year, into uncharted territory. And this has come about as a result of a lobbying campaign by transparency advocates who used the revelations of the 2004 USS Nimitz carrier battle group incident and others that took place off the coast of Virginia with the USS Theodore Roosevelt. They've used these incidents to run a campaign in the New York Times, Fox News, CNN, and different news networks to essentially compel the American legislature, the Congress, to mandate that there be proper reporting. And for the first time, hopefully this year, at least congressional committees in camera will get to hear whatever the classified information is that has been withheld from the American public for so long. So we may very well be close to the beginnings of an answer. But did any of your friends or associates in the media try to dissuade you from writing in plain sight because they felt it might somehow damage your professional standing and your credibility would be put into jeopardy regarding future projects in which you may be involved. It's funny, you know, I, I certainly have had friends who've questioned why I would write a book about UFO. And normally what happens is an ironic smile comes across their face when I tell them that I've, you know, I was doing it. And they would say, are you sure you want to do this? I said, isn't this going to damage, you know, they've said, you know, isn't this going to damage your career? And I'd go, well, I think it's legitimate area for investigation. I mean, it's no less legitimate than investigating the war in the Ukraine or terrorism. And the interesting thing is most journalists in the mainstream media are not aware of the overwhelming evidence that supports the narrative that there is a genuine mystery. And Stan, it's all been resolved pretty much since July 2020, when the US Pentagon, the Department of Defense in the United States, made a press release which definitively acknowledged that it could not explain the three videos that were released called the Tic Tac video, the Gimbal video, and the Go Fast video, which were all recorded by US fighter pilots from different carrier battle groups. And it was then followed up by a UAP task force report mandated by the Congress, which went to the Congress in July, sorry, June last year. And on June the 25th, 2021, the matter was resolved once and for all, because the UAP task force was told, secretly investigate, 144 UAP sighting from 2004 right through to 2021. And they investigated those 144 sightings, and they could only explain one of them. So 143 out of the 140 for sighting using the resources of the US Defense Department, the secret capabilities that they have to, you know, they've got satellites, radar, the top of the line technology. They could not explain what these solid anomalous objects were that were buzzing fighter, fighter jet aircraft. Increasingly, it's happening still today. Pilots go out with their FA-18 fighter attack aircraft off the east coast of the USA and almost on a daily basis, they are seeing swarms of these objects. They're recording them on top of the line sophisticated phased array radar systems, the SPY-1 radar. This is technology that really cannot be refuted. It is essentially acknowledging that there are objects doing things in our atmosphere and indeed underwater and also in orbit, which are doing maneuvers, speeds, and displaying capability far beyond known human technology. This isn't some whimsy. It's not some fly on the, you know, it's not it's not some crazy idea from some tinfoil hat nutter. This this is the, the this is the Pentagon, no less. The Department of Defense of the United States of America has formally admitted UFOs, UAPs are 
a genuine mystery. They cannot explain them. And what was more significant in that June the 25th, 2021 report was that the Pentagon admitted after years of saying the opposite, that these things were a threat to public flight safety. And they were also a potential threat to national security. And so that's immediately become a priority inside the Congress. The fact that there are anomalous objects breaching US and other countries, including mine airspace, and they cannot be controlled. They cannot be tracked. They cannot be explained. And this has been happening for decades, since at least the, the Second World War, but clearly, I suspect, far longer, probably thousands of years. And we've all turned a blind eye to it because it's been kind of uncomfortable. Just there, corner of our eye, something is going on that we can't explain. Something paranormal, something beyond known human understanding, something far beyond known human technology. And I think what often has happened, a lot of people prescribe that there's a conspiracy, that there are these dark men in uniform sitting in a dark room somewhere. Maybe it's a skiff, one of those secret rooms where they contain the sound and stop any emission. And they're secretly plotting to keep this incredible secret from the world. But you know what I suspect? I suspect there may be one or two people like that, but I suspect the vast number of people who've been keeping this secret are people who are just unnerved by the fact that there is an anomalous phenomena manifesting itself to humanity and they can't bloody explain it. And they're meant to be the Air Force. They're meant to be one of the top intelligence agencies. They're meant to be the head of our military. And they're as bewildered about it as you and I are. And for years, I think, frankly, if I can say this on your show, they've had their heads up their butts. They've ignored it because it's uncomfortable. It's disturbing. And I think the issue is the evidence has now been presented in such a way that it is irrefutable. Even the most diehard debunkers and skeptics can't dismiss this with prosaic explanation. And so for the first time in history, we're now getting a UAP task force inside the intelligence community and the Defense Department the United States, engaging not only with American intelligence agencies and defense agencies, but also with all of the Five Eyes nations and overseas allies, and trying to get answers to explain this phenomenon. And that's why I'm very confident that we may indeed be on the cusp of finding out an answer to what I suspect is one of the greatest mysteries in humankind. In the extensive research you've done for In Plain Sight, you've spoken with countless witnesses, researchers, scientists, spies, and defense and intelligence officials and insiders. What I would like to do now, Ross, is ask you a few questions about some of those people you've interviewed from those categories. Here goes. When interviewing witnesses who claim to have had interactions with UFOs or ETs, what criteria or investigative skills did you put to use to separate those who were telling the truth from those who are fabricating events? And how did you go about separating real cover-ups and conspiracies from questionable ones? Okay, Stan, let's start from basics. The first question I invariably get asked, often by a lot of podcasters or interviewers, is do I believe in UFOs? And I go, no, I don't believe in UFOs. Belief is an expression of religious faith. Belief is an expression of suspension of knowledge application. It's essentially saying, well, bugger the evidence, I believe. What I believe, what I know, what I know as a result of the collation of evidence and analysis of that evidence, using corroborative witnesses, using video that I've been able to corroborate the authenticity of using radar tracks or, or um, FLIR imaging. I've convinced myself that there is indeed an anomalous phenomena that is displaying what one uh, insider has called the five observable. And these are capabilities of these objects which are beyond our current technology, hypersonic speeds, hypersonic maneuvers, incredible, you know, turns on a dime, transmedium travel going into water and going into the space. They're doing things that are clearly intelligently controlled that we cannot explain. Now, one of the things that I often get is I get people contacting me who say that they're victims of abduction or that they've basically um, had encounters with aliens. And uh, there's a lot of people like that. And I'm not dismissing what they say, but they want me sometimes just to believe them. And there's often a question they say, do you believe me? And I go, well, my belief's not relevant. And then they get quite annoyed with me sometimes because they go, well, what do you mean belief's not relevant? And I go, well, I'm not, I'm not in the business of belief. I'm not a priest. 
I'm, I'm a journalist. I'm, I apply evidence. And I, sometimes people have slammed the phone down on me because they get very annoyed. They think I'm being petulant with them, but I'm not. The only way that we have to assess the truth, the aut authenticity of any claim in this current day and age is what's ever since the Enlightenment for four or 500 years, we've called the scientific method. And essentially the scientific method is all about applying evidence and facts to what we're seeing and seeing if we can provide an explanation for what we're seeing using the facts and the evidence that we have at our disposal. And I think sometimes, and I say this in my book, I say that I think the scientific method is often used in a dogmatic way by some scientists to try to discount the legitimacy of the UAP phenomenon because they don't like admitting that there's something that they can't explain. But now we're getting to the point where science is begrudgingly admitting, and this was an epoch moment when the Pentagon actually made the admission in its UAP task force report that it couldn't explain these technologies. And that was after they'd looked at phased array radar tracks, which are still classified to this day. The data from the USS 2004 Nimitz incident is still classified to this day. The public is not allowed to see it. The full videos, the full high resolution videos of the Tic Tac incident, the Gimbal incident, and the GoFast incident are still classified to this day. I've spoken to people in the defense and intelligence area who've told me that they've seen some of these videos and that if the public saw what they'd seen, it would be a slam dunk that people would then know, not necessarily believe, but know that the phenomenon is real. And so ultimately what we're talking about when we talk about what levels of proof we use, pretty much the same kind of levels of proof that you use to prove your evidence in a court case. You get witnesses, you depose those witnesses, you question them, you cross-examine them. I was trained as a lawyer. I worked as a lawyer briefly before I became a journalist as an attorney. You learn about the application of evidence and fact to a possible scenario, to a possible hypothesis that explains that situation. And then if you find inconsistencies, you seek to, to resolve those inconsistencies. You test the credibility of witnesses. You look at their motivation for why they're saying what they're saying. You look at the videos and you say, okay, is it possible that this video could have been interfered with? Is there a prosaic, a mundane explanation for what you're seeing on that video? And often there is. And that's why I actually embrace skeptics. There's a, there's a lovely fellow who I actually really admire called Mick West, who's a um, Brit based in the US who regularly seeks to try to debunk UFO video, particularly the US Navy's Tic Tac video, which is the, the mainstay video that has been used to support the contention that the US Navy has indeed witnessed anomalous unexplainable phenomena. And I think it's very healthy that there is constantly skeptical analysis of what is being relied upon to support the hypothesis that there is indeed anomalous phenomena manifesting itself in our atmosphere. And I, I think I, nobody would be happier than me to see an explanation. If it turned out that this was Chinese or Russian drones that are so super, super advanced, we just aren't even aware of them yet, even though I wouldn't be comfortable with that as a, an ally of the United States and as a person who's concerned concerned about authoritarian dictatorships like Russia and like China, um, at least we'd have an explanation. But I don't think that explanation does suffice because on the evidence, this is a technology that is not within the, the capabilities of the Russians or the Chinese or indeed of anybody on this planet. And so then it raises that very uncomfortable possibility that once you've excluded all the other explanation, could this be something that is non-human? And that's where we're at at the moment. I mean, we've had the most extraordinary situation where even former heads of the Central Intelligence Aid have actually admitted that one possible explanation for what we're seeing here is that this could be extraterrestrial life. That we could be looking at the possibility that what we're looking at here is non-human intelligence that we're engaging with for the first time. And that's really exciting. And even Avril Haynes, who's the Director of National Intelligence in the United States, she's the person who's, if you like, the intelligence czar of the US, she has admitted that she cannot explain some of what's being seen in our skies. And she's raised the possibility of it being extraterrestrial. A former director of national intelligence, James Clapper, he said that he accepts that it might be other life other than human life, intelligent life. I think it's really important, he says, that whenever we witness such phenomena, that it is recorded and documented for future when we may gather more information and have a better understanding of what is transpiring. Could there be other life out there? Sure. You can't reject that possibility. The former director of national intelligence, 
intelligence, John Ratcliffe, said there are a lot more sightings than have been made public. We are talking about objects that frankly engage in actions that are difficult to explain, movements that are hard to replicate, that we don't have the technology for. They're traveling at speeds that exceed the sound barrier without a, a sonic boom. Sometimes we wonder whether our adversaries have technologies that are a little bit further down the road than we realize. It's not just a pilot or just a satellite or some intelligence collection. We have multiple sensors that are picking up these things. The current director of national intelligence, Avril Hain, she said, there's the question of, is there something else that we simply do not understand, which might come extraterrestrially? That's the DNI. That's the intelligence czar of the US. And if you look back in history, this isn't the first time that people at a high level in the United States government have admitted this. The first director of the CIA, Admiral Roscoe Hillencotter, said in the 1950s, it is time for the truth to be brought out. Behind the scenes, high-ranking Air Force officers are soberly concerned about UFOs. But through official secrecy and ridicule, many citizens are led to believe the unknown flying objects are nonsense. And then if you roll forward 75 years, there's a former CIA director, John Brennan, who just said last year, I've seen some of those videos from Navy pilots, and I must tell you, they are quite eyebrow raising. Life is defined in many ways. I think it's a bit presumptuous and arrogant for us to believe there's no form of life in anywhere else in the entire universe. I think some of the phenomena we're going to be seeing is the result of something that we don't yet understand. And that could involve some type of activity that some might say constitute a different form of life. That's a former director of the CIA, John Brennan. I mean, this is breathtaking. And the thing that blows me away, Stan, is a lot of this isn't being reported in the United States. James Woolsey, another former CIA director, he came out and described an incident in an interview with a friend of mine, John Greenwald from the Black Vault website. And it's the craziest, it's wacky when you actually hear him describe it. There was one case, he says, in which a friend of mine was able to have his aircraft stop at 40,000 feet and not continue operating as a normal aircraft. What was going on? I don't know. Does anybody know? There have been enough things like that have occurred like that, that I think there will be a lot of examination of what's going on over the course of the next several months or years. I'm not as skeptical as I was a few years ago, to put it mildly. Something is going on that is surprising to a lot of intelligent, experienced aircraft pilots. Uh, should viewers of Paranormal Yakker want to buy in plain sight an investigation into UFOs and impossible science? How can they do that? Um, it's now been reprinted. It's available in all good bookshops, hopefully in Canada or the US. And if it's not, you can just go to your bookshop owner and ask them to get it in because it's now available from HarperCollins publishers in the US and Canada. Um, uh, if you have any difficulties at all, let me know. They can go to inplainsight-book.com or they can get in touch with me, rosscoulthart.com, R-O-S-S-C-O-U-L-T-H-A-R-T.com and I'd happily help them. It's also available on Amazon as both a Kindle and a talking book and you can hear my appalling imitations of American accents on the Audible version. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's available in multiple versions all around the world and soon to be translated in to Japanese, Danish, French, and Spanish. Ross Coulthard, I thank you for being my guest on Paranormal Yakker. I appreciate you taking the time from your busy schedule to do the interview, and I wish you continued success in plain sight. Thank you, Stan. Hi, everyone. This is Stan Mallow, the Paranormal Yakker. I hope you enjoyed part one of my interview with Ross Coulthard. In part two, he'll reveal what defense and intelligence officials and insiders, as well as scientists who had exclusive access to UFOs, told him. The truth is out there, and Ross knows it. To be sure you don't miss part two of my interview with Ross or any of my other upcoming interviews, be sure to subscribe to my free YouTube channel. All you have to do is press the subscribe button on your screen.